The following is a lecture that was given by Mr. Walter Brisch at the National Jewish Community, March the 5th, 1969. Well, they started out with various minor teachers and then went to the Conservatoire in, in Paris where he studied with one of the great masters, Fauré. So here is, of course, a man who deserves the highest respect and got the highest respect from almost all his pupils. He, well, for a long time, he, he changed, he modernized himself quite much and went along. Nevertheless, I think he, in the beginning, did not see the greatness of Ravel's talent. And lots of other people didn't either. For instance, uh, it was almost a tradition that the gifted young French composers apply for the price of their own, which was one of the highest honors they could get. And one of the ones who never got it, though he applied twice, or th uh, three times, I think, even, was Ravel. He never made it. You see? And if you read now who, who got it, you say, who the heck is that? It is nothing. It names don't, don't mean much to us. So he was, in that respect, not immediately recognized at all. His two first published works, which I think is also a certain indication, were, uh, were published in 95. So he was only 20 years, which is still a fairly good record for a beginner. The one is Menuit en Pique. So you see that he has already some stylizing. It's not just a uh, sonata or intermezzo or something. So an antique Menuit and the other Habanera. So there's the Spanish influence. You see, and this, of course, you can follow through his whole life. There's a, it's a tremendous amount of, of uh, research in, in different styles, in different uh, periods of music going on. And it is one of the very rare events that the composer, within all those things, finds a tremendously strong personality. Because whatever he says is, in the long run, Ravel. Just for the fun of it, I made a little list of the diverse things. Spanish, of course, is a whole, whole bunch of them. Rhapsody, Espanol, Bolero, Habanera, Vocalese, which is, uh, is on, on, on formed Habanera, as he calls it. Then there is the Sherizad, which is an Arabian style composition. There are songs, Greek songs. There are two uh, melodies Hebraic, so Hebrew melodies, and then one song, song Hebraic. So the Hebrew inter interested in two. There are pieces that are strongly influenced from the Viennese style, which is the, the Vals, Noble et Sentiment style, and La Vals, a, a symphonic poem that is uh, actually not just a Vals, but it is supposedly a description of post World War I Vienna, with all the tensions and the decay of the town in those days. There is Old French studies, uh, Tombeau du Couperin, a, a grave stone for, for the old French composer Couperin, Savan, an old French dance. There is a gypsy piece, which he calls Tigan, or Tigoiner, for violin and piano or orchestra. So this, this alone is, of course, a, a diversity of styles that is immense. And at the same time, uh, you will, if you are acquainted with one of them, recognize his very, very strong personal touch in, in almost every one of the works. He was also interested in instrumentation for instrumentation's sake. And he took, for instance, the famous pictures of, of an uh, exhibition uh, by Mussorgsky and made a very beautiful instrumentation of it, which uh, some people object to because uh, it's a little bit odd to hear a saxophone playing in music that was written long before the saxophone was invented. But an even greater one than Ravel did that too, and that's no such who instrumentated the, Mendel, the, the, the Handel Messiah and put clarinet in that were not invented when, when Handel composed that work, you see? So in, in that respect, it's uh, a very open question for us to, to say uh, whether He's right or it's wrong, or I don't know what, and I think that the purists are always wrong in a case like that. If it's 
beautiful and effective. Maybe the composer would have enjoyed it tremendously, I'm sure. So they, of course, he was very interested in any form of music, which he wrote for Diaghilev, the famous, famous Russian dancer and choreographer. He was interested even in writing piano scores of, of his own work, which is unusual, mostly the composers don't bother with that. But he wrote that the piano settings of his orchestra, of, of his orchestral work himself. And, of course, then came this... Uh, this idea of the work for the left hand alone, into which we are going in one minute, and this also is a special research that, that needs work. You, do, you don't just write for the left hand like you would write for, for two hands. You have to have a slightly different idea of the, of the sound in it. I just wanted to, to uh, without going into any biography, besides that there is not too much really biographical interest in, in, in his life. Uh, he was an extremely quiet, reserved, modest man with a very strong underlying character. You see, so I mean, if you saw him, you would not have imagined that he would, would be as firm about many matters of principle. And uh, I have one example of one letter here which I want to read to you to show you what tremendous strength there was in that guy and what conviction there was in him. Uh, as a performer, he was not much to be super enthusiastic about. I heard him play the piano several times. And I must say that each time I thought, well, that's not the way to do those things. Which, of course, sounds very arrogant, but it's the last thing I mean. I just have a feeling that he was almost too humble, like, like, you know, say, oh, it's not so great. You see, I mean, the, in conducting, he stood there and sort of gave his blessings to whatever went on. <laughs> his, uh, his piano playing was quite reduced in tone. He did not have an overwhelming technique, avoided playing the hardest pieces of his composition, usually stuck to his very charming and very lovely sonatina, which is relatively accessible. In, in, in technical matters, and I, I believe that we will have a little little discussion on that later on, the trustworthiness of composers as performers and of contemporary performers. You see how much we should really believe that this is it, that this is the way it has to be done. So it, he did travel fairly much. He uh, said enough from, from 33 on, showed uh, a sign, signs of, of, of strong mental and physical disturbances. Part of his hand turned lame, part of his thinking processes got slowed down immensely. To me, it's always one of the saddest things when somebody asked him later, when, uh, while he was, uh, I don't know, in one of the islands in, in France for recovery and rest and so on. So I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting. And he's waiting to, to come back to normal again or something like that. So uh, I'm waiting. Seemingly uh, the, the disturbance also was aggravated by his being tortured by his own piece, the, the Bolero, which he wrote, which many of you may have heard, which is, uh, of course, meant to be torture. You see? And this, this I will bring out because this was one of the points I... I had uh, the great honor of discussing with him in person, and, and that he seemingly was tortured with that piece, couldn't get it out of his mind. See, so in, the, in, in 37, they tried a brain operation, and, and it didn't work. He died pretty soon after that, sadly enough, not immediately, but he had another month or six weeks, as far as I know. Of course, the format of, of, of Ravel has been growing on us, I think, since then, because then we were still a little bit uh, tempted to call him a French composer, now we call him a great composer. You see, there is uh, somewhere or another a strong anti-nationalistic trend in the guy. You see, we have a little bit of feeling uh, that French music, yeah, but uh, it is not nearly as nationalistic as many others, including Debussy, you see, who turned away 
by focus from all other influences, from German influences. Thought as hard as he could. You see, Ravel was was wide open to to the great masters of all nationalities, and even had a certain dislike for supernationality, you see. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to, to show you this one letter. You see, he did uh, a few things that, that really were close to being a hero, so to speak. First of all, he disliked the French Legion d'Honneur very much, the, the, the Legion of Honor, because they, they gave, in his opinion, they gave so many undeserving people some tremendous rewards. When they offered one to him, he said, no thanks. You see, he was asked in the year 16, in the middle of World War I, in other words, to join a committee of the National League for the defense of French music. You see, which of course was nationalistic. During the war, the war I mean, I, I remember from my very early childhood, for instance, at the evening in Vienna, which always pretended to be a little more cosmopolitan than others, in other parts of the world, that they still did not perform living enemy composers. So Puccini was out, for instance, you see. And then they did perform uh, Aida or Otello or something like that, or Rigoletto, but it was by Josef Verdi. <laughs> because Giuseppe is Italian. So it was by Josef Verdi. So that at least the dead ones were, were admissible, at least, but they had to have German first names. And in, in France, there, there was this group forming, and they wanted to discard all living foreign composers' performance. Mm -hmm. And he was asked to join this group. I might mention in that connection that he was a deep French patriot in other ways, that he even tried to get into the army and they didn't really want him, so he turned into an army truck driver, you see, just to do something. So it wasn't that he was anti-war anti, anti uh, war in the sense of trying to escape or, or uh, I mean, what is it, uh, hard burning or something like that at all. But he just, he just didn't, find, didn't find it right that music itself should overemphasize the nationalistic element, you see, which of course also indicates that he was not a pure romantic at heart at all because the romantics were always rather nationalistic, you see. So he says, I, I, I'm not reading the whole thing, the gentleman, an enforced rest finally allows me to acknowledge receipt of the announcement in statutes of the National League for the defense of, the defense of French music which reached me quite late. Naturally, I can only laud your fixed idea of the triumph of the fatherland, which has also pursued me ever since the opening of hostilities. Consequently, I fully approve the need for action out of which the National League was born. This need for action has been so strong in me that it forced me to quit civilian life when I was not obliged to. Where I cannot follow you is where you state the principle that the role of musical art is economic and social. You see, which of course is uh, uh, some of our idea. Uh, the, I have never considered either music or the other arts in that light. They, they got to the point of saying that, that this, this uh, by, let's say, by performing foreign music, they bring money to those people. You see, if they perform it, they get some cash value out of it and we help them that way. Not only is it bad, as a, as a sign of esteem of the enemy, but there is also some, some economic disadvantage in the thing. But I do not believe that for the safeguarding of our artistic national patrimony, it is necessary to prohibit the public performance in France of those contemporary German and Austrian works which do not lie within the public domain. It matters little to me that Mr. Schoenberg, for example, is an author. He is nonetheless a musician of great worth whose very interesting experiments have had a happy influence on certain allied composers, including our own. Moreover, I am delighted that Mr. Bartok Kodai and their disciples are Hungarian and manifested in their works 
with so much relish. You see, I mean, this, this is a wonderful thing to say. Of course, they are, they are Hungarian, and are, they, what, is, what is likable about them, you see? Uh, in Germany, aside from Richard Strauss, we hardly see other than second-rate composers whose equivalent it would be easy to find without crossing our frontiers. But it is possible that shortly some young artist will appear there whom it would be interesting to know here. On the other hand, I do not think it necessary that all French music be made to predominate in France or be spread abroad no matter what it's worth. So you see, gentlemen, that my opinion differs from yours on so many levels that I cannot permit myself the honor of being considered one of you. I hope, nevertheless, to continue to act as a Frenchman. You see, that's what, those are quotations of, of the letter he got, if you have to, you have to act as a Frenchman, and, and to count myself among those who mean never to forget that they are Frenchmen. You see, I, I, I think it shows, this shows a, a tremendous strength of character, you see. Now, I want to gradually switch over to this piece and the, the man for whom it was, it was written, who, of course, in his own way, was also such a gigantic figure. I don't know whether that name means anything to you. Paul Wittgenstein, there are millions of, of Wittgensteins around. There are even princes Wittgenstein around. It is all more or less one family. The, uh, the family originally started as iron and coal people in what is now Czechoslovakia and was then, of course, part of the Austrian Empire. And they just came at the right time to the right place and within one generation changed from almost nothing into very wealthy and in the next generation into the millionaire's class. I would say one thing, though, that there were probably very few people on earth to use their money in a nobler and, and more helpful way as, as, as the Wittgenstein did. you see. This I have to say because I also had some great advantages from this family. Now, I, the family, of course, the, the center of musical interest was actually around his parents, and Wittgenstein as a very young man who still played into the Brahms period, Brahms seemingly went in and out in that house. Schumann's widow, Clara Schumann, went in and out, and many of the performers, or the early Brahms performers, went, were, were completely at home there, and I had the uh, great honor and pleasure to overlap just a little bit into that period by playing for instance, with a, an elderly violinist lady with a somewhat grim name, Soldat Röger, Marie Soldat Röger, who was the first woman to play the Brahms violin concerto against his wishes. Uh, he was always told that the concerto is unplayable. So, and then, uh, then Greg Joachim came along and played it, and people got around a little bit, and then he thought, well, a woman can't possibly play it. And the story goes that when she finally did play it as a young girl, uh, that he came out and kissed her on stage. And I just had a little bit of a feeling it must not have been too gorgeous looking because she had a beard too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people didn't care that much, I think. So she had a beard as, she, as long as she played beautifully. So. Uh, they did uh, one wonderful thing after another. There was an old lady pianist by the name of Marie Baumeyer, who also had played Brahms pretty much, who lived somewhere in, uh, in a Viennese uh, building on the fourth floor. And when she got old, she just uh, could hardly walk that thing anymore. So they, they told her they'd they get her there now to a different place. She said, no, she doesn't want to move. So they built into that old building, they built an elevator for her. You see, so, I mean, this is uh, what you really think millionaires should do, and you very seldom find, find them doing it. You see? So, the atmosphere in that, what people called Pali Wittgenstein in Vienna, and uh, they refused to call it that way. And it sure was a Pali. And they had another one in, the, in suburban Vienna, and so, I mean, the, 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 
The amount of money was well spent, I would say, because the, the art treasures were, were immense, and always so that the artist got some good art. So, yeah, they, he had an organ built for his organ teacher, who was a blind man, by the way, with a rather tragic name, Labor, and which means, of course, work. So he, he, had, he built him an organ. And this, this Paul Wittgenstein, who was trained as a pianist, pupil of the always famous Leschetizky, who was sort of a center of activity then in Indiana as a, as a teacher. Uh, he had also a tremendous advantage, I think, in, at six. He was married six times, and each one of his wives always were about the same age when he married them. And uh, they all were pianists. So that uh, there was a, he had uh, classes, and each one, of course, who won his election with one of his present future ex wives was a Lysitsky pupil. So there, there, were, there were really thousands of them around. <laughs> and, 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 and the pupils of the pupils of Lysitsky. And to us, of course, I don't know how great it was. I, uh, I can't say. I mean, I'm sure there were very many good things in it. Certain musical aspects of it never intrigued me very much. But uh, he definitely was a very representative pupil of Lysitsky. And uh, in World War I, he lost his right arm. First of all, a person without his immense drive and seriousness would have given up. Secondly, nobody but a very rich man could have done what he did to commission the greatest composers of his days to write work for him, especially. I mean, my, my own teacher, Franz Schmidt, really uh, spent his last 10 years in uh, much greater ease than he would ever have been uh, able to, to live as a professor at the academy and a retired member of the Philharmonic and so on, because Wittgenstein ordered several works, paid very generously for them, and, and, and Schmidt was able to retire into a suburban uh, neighborhood and a house in Vienna and, and compose, which otherwise wouldn't have been possible. I mean, the other, the other masters, of course, were greater names that would, would have gotten along without him, but even so, he had two major works written for him by Richard Strauss. And the fact, of course, that they were written for him made it imperative for a conductor who wanted a new Richard Strauss work to have for Wittgenstein play it. So this, this was a, a wonderful entrance. And in, in many ways, of course, he, uh, he was a tremendously impressive player. I would say that it is not too illogical that somebody who has only one arm might suffer under the fiction that he can't be heard. And that in his case, of course, ended up occasionally with uh, getting so over robust that it hurt your ear a little bit. You see? But uh, this is, those are minor things. Uh, so, Ravel also was supposed to write a concerto for him. I wouldn't know what the, what the sum was he got for it, and of course uh, this would be hard to find an equivalent now, anyhow, in our various monies and devaluations and evaluations, and I don't know what else. But uh, anyhow, I'm sure that both Richard Strauss and Ravel and also Prokofiev, who wrote the work for him, didn't do it just for the fun of it. In spite of the fact that they had fun, it showed. They got quite intrigued with the idea of the left hand, you see. If uh, for some reason, some of you may think, well, isn't it funny that uh, people did write for the left hand and there's almost never anything for the right hand. It's an organic and logical thing because our, in a way the left hand is a better top hand because the thumb is on top and the, the bringing out of a melody is much easier than with a poor little fifth finger of the right hand, which is the pianist's fate normally, you see. That respect, the piano is, is just a little bit uh, unfortunate because the f most important thing is, is the top as a rule, as a melody. So that's a weak finger. Next most important thing is the bass, and that's a weak finger. 
we, so we can uh, can play that way. If, uh, there, there are like, some experimental things for the right hand, but there are several works written for left hand, even just as plain studies. Brahms wrote the famous violin, Chacon, a, 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 a paraphrase of it, which almost is, is a complete quotation for the left hand alone. And uh, I might just mention the, the good intention and the somewhat gruesome result that his admired Clara Schumann, wife of widow of, of Robert Schumann, who was a marvelous pianist, of course, complained that her right arm got very sore and she had to quit playing piano for a while. So he had this brainstorm of writing the, the Chacon and the arrangement for the left hand alone. And after a little while, I left and got sore too. Because it's just insanely difficult. And see what he meant well. And the piece is, as such, quite fascinating.